programmes are going to be about the inland waterways of the north, which is a new subject for me because I've never been a watery sort of chap. Could be converted though because it all looks very pretty. This is York Minster, which is one of the masterpieces of English medieval building. Wonderful, wonderful church. And I've got two questions to ask you about it. Question number one, how heavy is it? That's how heavy is it? And question number two, what on earth does it have to do with inland waterways? The answer to the first question is really quite easy. The answer is very. York Minster is very heavy, and that's because, of course, it's made of stone, big bits of very heavy stone. And that leads on to the second question, because the stone doesn't come from here. It's a magnesian limestone, which medieval builders loved because of its gleamy whiteness, which made it perfect for a spiritual building like this. But it comes from Tadcaster. It's nine miles away from here as the crow flies and far, far too far to haul this quantity of very heavy stone on the sort of roads and with the sort of wagons that they had in those days. So they did what the Romans had done before them and the Saxons and the Vikings. They all used the inland waterways of Britain. In this case, the waters of the River Ouse and the tributaries that ran into it. It seems easy to understand people using rivers for transport when they're really big, like the Mississippi or something, but these English rivers, like the Ouse, don't look big enough for boats filled, for example, with stone, and yet they clearly were. That heavy stone, for example, from the Minster, was brought from Tadcaster on barges and had to be taken down the River Wharf, first of all, and back up the Ouse against the flow. They were able to do it, of course, because ships in the past were much smaller than they are today. I said a moment ago that the Romans had sailed up this river and probably the Saxons and quite certainly the Vikings, which is why we've come to the village of Stillingfleet on the river a few miles south of York to see the original south door of the parish church. The door in question went with this absolutely fabulous Norman door surround which must have been carved about the year 1100 and something or other. I feel like standing here like a Victorian father to make sure that you have a really good look at it. But the door itself has finally been taken inside to protect its ancient wood and ironwork. This is it, superb hinges, with ends like dragon's heads. An odd-looking couple, who may or indeed may not represent Adam and Eve, and a ship. I'm assuming, I hope I'm right here, because I haven't seen anything that actually proves it, but that this is the sort of boat that the villagers would have seen in 1100 and something or other, beating its way up to York. Flat bottom to cope with the shallow water, a big paddly rudder to steer it round the innumerable shoals and sandbanks and a massive stern to look impressive. The prow, presumably equally massive, had been lost some time over the centuries, and there are suggestions that it would have had a mast and a sail originally. But there it is, a Viking boat on the inland waterways of Yorkshire. Anyway, this is what all the fuss was about, the city of York. For much of its history, York was quite a major port, even though it's about 40 or 50 miles from the open sea. Now that's not unusual though, because dozens and dozens of English towns that we now think of as entirely inland were actually seaports for much of their history. This was York's port, its harbour. It's known as King's Stave. There's another landing place on the other side of the river called Queen's Stave. A stave is just another word for a quay, a quayside. And this one is not that big, but that's typical of the quays on inland ports. But in the past, real commerce went on here. 
The stuff that was light and valuable was probably better sent by road, but anything heavy like stone or coal, or anything that needed to be carried in bulk, or anything that was breakable even, was much more likely to arrive by boat. You usually get a couple of stages in the buildings on a quayside. At first it was where the merchants lived, it was where the money was being made, so that was where they lived, and this is a classic merchant's house. Posh, would you say? Well, I would say posh to super posh. That's the Queen Anne style, built about 1710, a magnificent early 18th century house. But you notice that the ground floor is subtly different, stone instead of brick with odd openings. That's where the merchant stored his goods, and he lived above the shop, so to speak. The next stage began later in the 18th century, when instead of living on the job, the merchants moved away and built warehouses instead. As ships got a bit bigger and trade a bit faster, more storage was needed. And so from about the second half of the 18th century, this is what they built. These are actually Victorian examples, as it happens, but it gives the impression. So there you are, a little seaport 50 miles from the sea. One of the most interesting inland keys in England, in my opinion, is the one at Lancaster, St George's Quay, which was only built in about 1750, so it's probably the last inland quay to be built in England. And it was lined with four-storey stone warehouses, almost all of which survive, complete with their loading doors and hoists, even though most of them have been converted into very desirable flats and things nowadays. Of course, sailors cannot live by warehouses alone, oh no, they need drink. There are reputed to have been about 60 pubs along here at one time, there's just two or three left now, but uh, I've never been a sailor myself and yet I am strangely drawn. And it is a nice Georgian building. Go on then. Ever obedient. Lancaster's trade was mainly with the West Indies, so these warehouses would have been full of rum and cotton, sugar and tobacco, and with valuable stuff like that you did of course need a customs house, and Lancaster has got one with bells on. It was built in 1765 and it's an absolute little perler. It was designed by a local architect called Richard Gillow, and it's an almost perfect example of a style called the Palladian style, named after the 16th century Italian architect Andrea Palladio. Palladio's buildings were often like temples with a pediment and columns, in this case ionic columns which rested on a sort of raised basement or podium made of rusticated stonework. This is rustication, deeply grooved joints between the stone. The main rooms were always upstairs, on what was called the Piano Nobile. No idea why, but they were posh. It takes real money to provide quality of this sort, but the sad truth here is that the money came from slavery, because Lancaster was the fourth largest slave port in England. All over the city there are houses that belong to slave traders who sent ships out to Africa, picked up slaves, sold them in the West Indies and then came back here with all the stuff that I mentioned before. This was the house of a man called Dodge and Foster for example, and a very odd house it is. We can only assume that it subsided because it's built on dodgy foundations. Well, it was built on dodgy financial foundations as well, because Foster was the owner of two ships which made five slave trips and took 650 slaves to the West Indies. It's a beautiful place down here by the river, beautiful architecture, but it's a sad truth that a good proportion of the beautiful buildings of the past were built on suffering. You hardly ever make enough money to build mansions or great estates by being fair to the workers, but here, oh, God knows how much suffering went into the building of this place. But you know, one of the things, one of the lovely things that's happened recently has been some sort of recognition of that suffering. 
This is Lancaster's new captured African statue by the sculptor Kevin Dalton Johnston, packed with beauty and with facts about the amount of pain involved. You can't put the past right, but it makes it more acceptable to enjoy the legacy if you at least acknowledge where it came from. One final inland riverside quay, the biggest and the most dramatic of them all. Newcastle's quayside was 541 yards long and for hundreds of years absolutely thronged with shipping. One week in the 1730s, over 500 ships sailed away from this wharf. Like York, it was lined with the houses of wealthy merchants and shipping offices and warehouses. I'd like to spend ages exploring it, but look at the time, and I haven't even mentioned canals yet. Do you start to worry when somebody says, this is the absolute truth? Well, start to worry, because this is the absolute truth. The very day when I started to think about what to put in this program, I was faffing around on the telly and I came across Fred Dibner talking about this, the first proper commercial canal of the Industrial Revolution, opened in 1761. Do you know, he was brilliant. He made it look wonderful, and he was just so rich in knowledge about it. He knew all the history about James Brindley, the Duke of Bridgewater's great engineer, who was so important in the development of the British canal system. Fred had such a passion for his subject. He said he'd been born beside this canal and he'd sailed boats in it since he was a child. He knew every inch of it. Do you know, I felt so inadequate because I was born in Carlisle and I live in Newcastle and neither of those places have got canals, never have had. Well, Carlisle had one briefly a couple of hundred years ago, but Newcastle and the North East have never had any. So all of this is completely new to me. But mind, I love it. <laughs> I'm actually at a place called Worsley on the west side of Manchester. The water's a bit orange here for reasons that I'll tell you about later, but it's so placid and so beautiful and slow moving, and all of the features are pretty and picturesque. The half-timbered house is typical of rural Lancashire, but it's called the Packet House because packet boats used to carry passengers from there into central Manchester. And this pretty looking shed is Britain's oldest inland waterway boatyard. Started in the 18th century and still going strong today. Considering that this was a new industrial transport system in the late 18th century, they certainly went to the limit in making sure it all looked nice. Imagine if our motorways were as pretty as this. There's a thought. But wherever you go, you get the same prettiness. And, of course, the system is positively dripping with pretty little places like this. This is Barrowford Locks near Nelson in Lancashire. Almost without exception, the architecture of canals is attractive and agreeable. The lock keepers' cottages seem to have been specifically designed to make you feel jealous and dissatisfied with your lot. And they seem to be always lived in by people with a public-spirited attitude towards flowers and prettiness. They're just gorgeous. And then there are the locks. I've never done it myself, but I've got friends who have been on narrowboat holidays and to a man, or indeed to a woman and a child, they seem to love the business of going through locks because it is so technical and so real. It's the sort of thing that you'd never expect to be allowed to do on your own. To be positively encouraged to haul on that wonderfully solid and worn wooden lever and release all of that power all on your own. Oh. It's almost too exciting. This is called a pound lock because the water gets impounded or imprisoned between two sets of gates. Pound locks were invented in Italy in the 15th century and in fact they've been used on rivers in England since the 1500s. They're such an elegant solution to the problem of allowing boats to get up and down hills and they're environmentally friendly too. They don't waste water and they don't require any additional source of power. But, and I'm just beginning to realise this, they're not simple at all. <laughs> 
My understanding of what canals are begins to change when I come somewhere like this. This is the Bingley Five Rise on the Leeds to Liverpool Canal. It's called a Five Rise because there are five locks, one after the other, climbing up the hillside. That's obvious, isn't it? I needn't have told you that. Fred Dibner wouldn't have told you that. But you look at this and you begin to realise that it's not just pretty rural stuff. This is a big engineering deal. This canal crosses the Pennines, for heaven's sake. I've owned cars that have struggled doing that. But this lets boats sail over the mountains. It takes 91 locks like these to do it, mind you. That's a whole heap of engineering. And then there are the tunnels. This is the Fowl Ridge Tunnel on the Lancashire side of the Pennines, which was opened in 1796. This is its southwest entrance. And this, one mile later, is its northeast entrance. How much effort and skill was needed to dig a tunnel a mile long without any sort of mechanical aids at all, with nothing but picks and shovels? Do I sound a bit breathless here, as if I'm getting somewhat carried away by my newfound wonder at the engineering skills displayed by the canal builders? Well, let me tell you, I have no but started. Take the Lancaster Canal, for example. It's not one of the best known or most dramatic, but you see, it's oodles of miles long. It goes from Preston to Lancaster and way up north to Kendal and the southern edge of the lakes, and yet... Are you listening to me here? Because it only has eight locks. It was so brilliantly surveyed and engineered that it manages to potter all over the notoriously bumpy north with only eight locks. The engineer was a great Scottish engineer called John Rennie, and he was responsible for a number of aqueducts, including this one over the River Loon at Lancaster, which in my opinion seems to be the architectural masterpiece of the canal system. Aqueducts anyway are an amazing idea, it seems to me. Oh, there's a river. Let's build another river over the top of it. But this one is such a noble piece of architecture, like something the Romans might have built. In fact, it cost a fortune, and it virtually bankrupted the whole canal. But it's good. Everything I've shown you so far has been pretty well what I expected canals to look like. Bigger and better, perhaps, and cleverer than I'd thought, but still traditional canal-y sorts of places, drifting through the countryside-y sorts of places. Well, you can forget all about that here. This is the Anderton boat lift in the village of Anderton in North Cheshire, and it is not traditional at all. This is not at all what I expected. You see, there were two waterways here which rather neatly bring the two halves of this programme together. There's the River Weaver, which had been made more navigable in the early 18th century and was used to export salt from the Cheshire salt mines. And there was the Trenton Mersey Canal, which was built to import China clay to the potteries of Staffordshire. They were really close to each other here, so they decided to join them together, even though one of them was 50 feet up above the other. So they built this extraordinary structure so the boats could be lowered or raised in sort of metal water-filled boxes or caissons. They worked on, well, they still do work on hydraulic power, with the weight of one caisson going down, pushing the opposite one up again. Damn cunning and entirely thrilling to look at. When you start looking, you find astonishing engineering like the Anderton boat lift all over the system. This is the very first proper canal, the Bridgewater Canal, where it crosses the River Irwell west of Manchester. Originally there was an aqueduct over the river here, but when the river was turned into a massive inland waterway known as the Manchester Ship Canal in the 1890s, the aqueduct had to be demolished to let bigger ships come through, so they built a movable canal instead. When I was writing this stuff, I found myself writing more and more exclamation marks. Movable canal? The whole canal gets sealed off at this point by a series of gates, leaving 800 tonnes of water on the bridge, and it turns. <laughs> 
But you see, I shouldn't have been surprised that canals turned out to be more adventurous than I expected them to be, because that's the way that they started. Here I am back at the earliest to them all, Fred Dibner's Bridgewater Canal at Worsley, which was opened in 1761, to take coal to Manchester, which is a nice, pretty traditional canal side scene. But it doesn't stop here. Along there, the canal went right to the mine. The water here is orange because it's stained by the minerals flooding out of the mine. The coal was loaded straight from the coal face right into the barges that took it to Manchester. This is one of the barges that they used. They were called starvationer boats because they were ribbed and thin, thin enough to sail deep into the mine. And what a mine it was. There were 46 miles of underground tunnels on four different levels, all joined by underground lifts and underground planes. At one stage, two million tonnes of coal a year came out of these tunnels. And this was the other end of the system, Manchester's Canal Basin, Castlefield, splendidly restored as a vibrant part of the modern city. A hotbed of early railway history, as we've already seen in one of the other programmes, but also the heart of the industrial canal world as well. There are miles of wharfs and docks. Canals ran directly into warehouses through giant arches. The boats were unloaded inside the building. How unexpected is that? This is still an extremely pretty landscape with everything that you might expect from canals. Picturesque, brightly painted boats, locks, water, lock keepers' cottages, the solid reliability of well-worn stone. But there's more here, more than pretty and picturesque. There's something bigger and more heroic than I expected when I first started looking at inland waterways. This is industrial architecture on a grand scale. 